Do you think maybe that all of that success that you had right from day one gave you the opportunity to look at the sport differently than some of your peers that maybe had to suffer through some lean years? Uh, when I very first started racing, I w wanted to do things to be recognized outside of my driving in a race car on a racetrack, you know. I mean, little things, you know, and I, believe me, I didn't go to college. This was just common sense that I felt, well, what can I do to be a little bit different that if they can't remember me on the racetrack for whatever reason, they might re remember me for off the racetrack. Uh, so I came up, I tried to come up with a theme, not color-wise, but style-wise, and I always had the one red sleeve, uh, and, and the rest of it was a different color, or at least one sleeve different. And that was my way of, you know, before maybe I got all the accolades on the racetrack, I was trying to get some off the racetrack, so, you know, I was just trying to create some attention uh, before, I was, before I created it with this thing right here. Probably one of the more memorable occasions before you came to Winston Cup Racing was in 1980 when you rode to Victory Lane with Johnny Rutherford. Did you think about that when you did it, or was it just a spur-of-the-moment thing? You know, it, it's amazing how many people in that situation of Rutherford and I going to Victory Lane together, how many people thought that was a planned, you know, premeditated situation there. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't. Uh, you know, I ran out of fuel, believe me, if I... I would have not tried to run out of fuel uh, and because I would have finished probably fifth, I guess, instead of ninth. But then I was talking to the crowd, you know, waving and stuff and having a good time, and, and J.R. drove behind me, and I didn't even see him, and I was looking at the crowd, and they were going, you know, like they were going, look over here, and I looked to my left, and there was Rutherford, and, you know, he, I could just see his hand in there motioning me, come on, come on, and I ran up to the car, and, you know, those things were pretty fragile at the time, the side pods, and... He said, I said, right here, and he said, yeah, get on. So I got on, and, you know, I knew he had won the thing, and he said, where'd you finish? And I said, I don't know. Uh, and I, it was kind of like a joke. I said, where'd you finish at? I said, you did win it, didn't you? And he said, yeah. And so then I held his hand up, and, uh, you know, I was a little embarrassed of, being, of holding the number one sign up because I was doing it for him. So I held the number one up and pointed to his helmet, and, you know, it's not bad to go to Victory Lane uh, either in a car or on a car in Indianapolis. And yet your trips to Victory Lane and Winston Cup racing have, have, have really been incredible, especially this year. Uh, it looks as if finally there's a, a new maturity to Tim Richmond, not only behind the wheel, but also with the public. It's like Tim Richmond has gone to phase two of his career. Well, I agree. You know, there there's phases for everybody's lives. You know, what happens this year is the phase prior to what happens the next year, the following year. And, you know, and I had the hair and the long long hair and the beard last year and things. You know, but that was the phase for this phase. And, but this phase isn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing some interviews here and I'm, things like that. But things are not that much different. If you were forced to choose solely between fame and fortune. Which would Tim Richmond take? <laughs> Absolutely fortune. Much rather go for the fortune than the fame. <laughs>